Good morning, church, and happy December to you. Can you believe we're in the second week of Advent already? Today we're beginning a brand new series with an Advent theme called God With Us. It's based on a verse from Matthew chapter 1 where we learn that the virgin would give birth to a son and they would call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's really a recurring theme in scripture. I love how Psalm 139 says it. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? There really is nowhere that you and I can go where God is not. And I guess, depending on your relationship with God, that's either a great comfort or a great fear. God is with you and he's always watching. Now for me, it's a comfort. I had another one of those God nods this week. God did it again in a big way. I'll talk more about that in the message, but basically, God stepped into my life at a time when I really needed to know that he was there. I'll share more with you about that later in the service. For now, just know that we're glad that you're here with us today. Let's begin our service with a wonderful hymn of praise. Let's sing. Amen. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. Advent is a season of the church year that is filled with anticipation. Each week, we light one of the candles on our Advent wreath to count down the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And today is the second Sunday of Advent, so we will light the first two blue candles on our wreath. 
As we do, let us together share the Advent hope that we have. Your responses will be on the screen. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Shine your light on us, Lord Jesus. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Shine your light on us, Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Come, Lord Jesus, and fill our dark world with your light. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to make ready the way of your only begotten Son, that by his coming we may be enabled to serve you with pure minds. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, as we come together for worship, let us begin by calling upon the name of our God, that name that unites us and defines us as God's people, that name that was placed on us in our baptisms, that name in which we find light and hope. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for worship today by confessing our sins to God and asking his forgiveness. Almighty God, through Jesus, our Lord, we have forgiveness in life, yet we often refuse to live lives transformed by your grace. We sin against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We follow our own sinful desires instead of living as your redeemed people. Lord, we're reminded in your word today that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief, and on that day, the heavens will disappear and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And yet, Lord, we confess that we have put too much effort into things that will not last. Instead of having our hearts and minds set on eternity, we've been more focused on earthly pursuits and successes. We have not sought first your kingdom and your righteousness, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We know that we deserve your righteous judgment, but Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our self-centeredness and for the lack of readiness in our hearts. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, the good news that I have for you today is that the Lord is patient. Our gospel reading today says, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Our Lord does not delight in judgment, but rather he turns his heart of grace toward those who are his own, those who bear his name. In fact, it was for you that he came into this world. It is for you that he took on human flesh and became Emmanuel, God with us. Friends, it's my joy and privilege to tell you today that Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you 
and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is in this knowledge that we are loved by God that we now prepare our hearts to hear his word. The first reading comes from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand, double for all her sins, a voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Because the breath of the Lord blows on them, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Says to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his, he, his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from Second Peter. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is slow in keeping his promise, as some do not understand, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done with it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought, to, ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Rejoice, and all the earth rejoice. He wraps. 
wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice Good morning, church. God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Today we're launching into a brand new message series called God With Us. And this series is based on what you could say is an anchor scripture for Christians. In this series, we're gonna look at the power of the incarnation, which is a theological term that means God became flesh and dwelt among us. And what we're using as a kind of theme verse for this series is it speaks about Christ's incarnation is found at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel in chapter 1, verse 23. It reads, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what's really telling is that it's easy for us to believe that God is with us when things are good, when you're on the mountaintop, when you get good news, or when you get a raise. If you've got small children and they sleep through the night, right? In these situations, it's easy to sense the presence of God in these mountaintop experiences when things are going good. But it's more difficult to sense his presence when you're in the valley, when things aren't going the way you want them to, or you get bad news, when you're hurting or you feel alone, when you're worried and afraid. That's what we're gonna be talking about today is God in the valley. And what's interesting, I think, is that so often, so much of your life can be going really well it's like these mountain ranges of goodness. But then there's just this one area that weighs everything else down. So much is good, but there's this one thing that brings some burden into your life. Now, many of you know that I've been going through some health struggles recently. I've had repeated chest infections that have left me kind of worn out and just not feeling well. And it's been going on for a couple of years now. And how that relates to what we're talking about today is that just this past Thanksgiving, we had a mountaintop experience of having everybody over for that big family dinner. And no, it wasn't more than 10 or three households if you're worried about that. But it was particularly special because one of our sons who lives out of town just got engaged and he joined us with his fiance. And our daughter had her boyfriend over and we got this extra time off work and it's all good. But there was this weight of this illness that I have that kind of brought a cloud over those good times, a bit of rain on the mountaintop experience. I was gonna say, did you ever feel like that? But then I realized that this year with coronavirus, everybody's got a dark cloud that's hanging over the good times, right? I wonder if there's any coronavirus memes about that. You know, it's like you reach for that bag of potato chips. It's looking good, but it doesn't taste quite right. A little bit like orange juice and toothpaste. Or you reach for a pair of your stylish shoes and there's just something missing. 
you go to reach for that toilet paper if, if you can find any and enough said you got that beautiful looking watermelon you cut into it your mouth is watering but it's not like the watermelons you remember it's the 2020 watermelon it looks like a watermelon but it's less or you go and light your holiday scented candles but they're a little different they're 2020 style yeah there's definitely a bit of a cloud over this year's mountaintop experiences but then there's this all right there's still hope but even outside of covid i'm sure you have this anyway some re some seasons and pockets of your life that are really good your your marriage is blessed but you've got a kid making crazy and stupid decisions or you're really close to god and you sense his presence but at the same time you're not sure how you're going to make ends meet or you've got grandbabies being born into the family that's good but you don't have the health or the resources to be able to visit them as often as you'd like. So the point is, even if you have mountaintops, there always are valleys to go along with them. So today's message really is about where is God in those valleys? Now, in the scriptures, valleys represent several things. You'll see that. Uh, in the valleys, there are often battles that take place. And some of you are probably right now going through some sort of a battle, maybe even a legal battle. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, valleys represent seasons of loneliness or desperation. But it's also interesting that in the Bible, valleys can represent a time of growth. It's true, uh, you enjoy God in some ways on the mountain, but you experience him in different ways when you're in the valley. In fact, if you're taking notes, this one's worth writing down. That is, we may enjoy God on the mountaintops, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys. We enjoy him, and we have this great relationship with him when times are really good. But we get to know him in a different way when we're in the valleys. Now, there's a particular Old Testament psalm that talks about those who find themselves in the valley. If you want to open your Bibles to Psalm 84, we're going to begin at verse 5. It reads, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now what is the valley of Baca? It's most likely related to a tree with very similar spelling that would ooze out sap in a way that made it look like it was crying. Actually, when I was younger, we used to have these trees in western New York. Uh, we call them weeping willows. Now, I don't know if there's any tree relation to the ones in the psalm, um, but what might, what might be the reason that this valley was named the Valley of Tears or the Valley of Weeping? Maybe it's because valleys were typically found in desert country where there were thorns and wild animals and snakes, even thieves and robbers, all kinds of danger in the valley. In fact, it was very difficult to get through a valley without something bad happening. That's why the psalmist also said, blessed are those whose strength is in you, God. Now, I know that a lot of people watching this service go to our church, but I've also been learning that there are others tuning in who don't go to our church and some who don't go to any church. Can I just say to you, if you don't know God intimately, then when you get to those times that are rough, those valleys, and you don't have God, then all you have is what you've got. Seriously, where do you turn? But for those who are in Christ, we believe that we have a strength that goes beyond just what we have. We have access to a heavenly power that goes way beyond ours. That's why the psalmist said, blessed are those whose strength is in you. It's been said, when you get to the end of you, that's not where you end, that's where God begins. When you're weak, he steps in. If you've ever lifted weights and you've done bench presses with free weights, one of the first things you learn is that you really should have a spotter, someone watching you. Because even if it's a lighter weight that you're using, but you're tired from the rest of your workout, or maybe how many reps you've done, you might find that you just don't have the strength to do one more wet rep, and that weight, it gets the best of you. And once you give out, it's just going to land on your chest. And so if you get in that spot where you just can't lift it, you've got somebody there to step in when your energy's spent. That's why the psalmist says, 
Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Now, we believe that when we get to the end of our strength, that our Heavenly Father is watching and he's ready to step in with divine strength that goes beyond our limits. So in other words, when you hit the end of your strength, he steps in and his strength, strength is made perfect in your weakness. If you're in a valley right now, you have access to the very real, ever-present power of a good God who is available and ready to come and assist you in your time of need. Blessed are those whose strength is in God. It doesn't say, blessed are those who make it on their own, or blessed are those who are really determined. One of the problems in our world today is that we almost idolize the spirit of independence. I want to be financially independent. I don't want to need anybody. I don't want to have to depend on anybody. I want to do it myself. It reminds me of the kind of thing a three-year-old says. I can do it myself. The problem is we weren't created to be independent. We were created by our God to depend on him and to depend on others. And this is very hard for some people to hear. But the truth is, blessed are you when you realize that you are dependent. But you also know that you have a power greater than yourself. That's why I always tell people, don't just dream big, but dream God-sized dreams. So you can dream a big dream of what you can do by yourself, and you might even achieve that big dream. But you only achieve God-sized dreams if you're dependent on Him. Some of you may need to lean into this and just admit, I don't have what it takes on my own. I need His presence. Acknowledge that you might be in a valley, but that you're not alone in it. God is bigger, and God is stronger than any valley that you're in. All right, so this verse goes on to say, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, the idea of pilgrimage means to go to the holy city of Jerusalem or Zion. That's where they're pilgrimaging to. And the thing about that city is it's up on a hill. In fact, when the prophets and the Psalms speak about Jerusalem, they always say, we're going up to Jerusalem or up to Zion. That's why there's a whole group of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, going up. Now, another way that you could look at it is that you can't get to the mountain without going through the valley. And quite frankly, you wouldn't make the climb if you didn't set your mind on it. It's something you need to be intentional about doing. So what is your heart set on? Is it set on pilgrimage? Is it set on the things of God? The Apostle Paul uses this expression when he's speaking to the Colossian Christians in chapter 3. And he says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Or when he told the Philippian believers in chapter 4, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure or lovely or admirable, if it's excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. See, what you think about matters. Now, I shared with you that my recent string of illnesses were kind of getting to me. I was feeling down. And, you know, when that happens, your mind can tend to go to the sort of the worst place. And I was talking to one of my counselor friends, and I was kind of doing that. What if this? What if that? You know, you kind of say, well, what if they run out of antibiotics to try? Or what if all these medicines are ruining my liver? Or what if I get an infection that they can't cure? And he just said, stop it. Stop letting your mind go to the worst place. And he talked to me about the importance of setting your thoughts on the positive, setting your mind on things above. Like the scripture says, whatever is pure or excellent, think about those things. Actually, actually Pastor Rick Warren was the first one I heard it say it this way. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, he says, if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. And the idea is your mind is going to constantly spin and think of things. So set your mind on the good things and on the things above on pilgrimage to the mountain of the Lord and on the things of God. See, some of you, your current situation might be in a valley, but your mind can still be set on God. Your heart might be anxious, but your mind is set. Your soul might be aching, but your mind is set on God. Your emotions might be racing, but your mind is set toward God. You may have too much to do. You may have pressure on this Christmas. And on and on it goes. But my mind is set on the goodness of God. He's with me. He's for me. Greater is the one that is in me than the one who is in the world. God has a plan for me. 
I may be in the valley, but my mind is set on the kingdom of God. Now, verse 6 goes on to say, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. See, we may be in the valley right now, but the valley is not our destination. What are we doing? We're just passing through. I may be in the valley right now, but this valley is not my home. You get that sense in the familiar words of Psalm 23 where David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, shadow of death. See, I may be in the valley, but I'm just passing through and I'm not passing alone. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, sometimes when you're in the valley, you just want to get out. God, get me out. Make it go away. But when that doesn't happen, what God may be showing you is that the way is through the valley, not out of the valley, right? The pilgrimage needs to go through the valley. The road to Zion goes through the valley. But while you're in it, you're just passing through it. So what does the psalm say next? As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. In other words, they prepared the soil so that when the autumn rains came, it became a place with pools and springs. What does that mean for you? It means if you're in a dry place, dig a well. Not the kind of well that goes down a few hundred feet. No, the kind you make by digging a little hole or even a, a ditch in the ground to catch the rain that will fall. And you say, well, but it's not raining now. See, that's faith. Faith in the provision of God. You dig a well. See, one of the popular Thanksgiving readings that we just had Thanksgiving, right? It's where the 10 lepers came to Jesus for healing, right? And Jesus simply said to them, go, show yourself to the priests. And it says, and as they went, they were cleansed. He didn't heal them first. They had to trust him first and go to the priests. Then they were healed on the way. See, if you dig it, he will fill it. If you plant it, he will grow it. You've got to plant your seed before you'll see the harvest. Now, I'm willing to bet that some of you listening haven't sensed the presence of God in a long time. It's time to dig a well. It's time to say, God, I'm going to wait for your presence. It's dry now, but I know you're going to bring the rain. Dig your well in the valley, and God will make it into a place of springs and pools. Think about this. You need to encounter God. You need an encounter with him. See, God rarely reveals himself to people who are rushed. When he spoke to Moses in the burning bush, he didn't just catch him on his cell phone driving in rush hour traffic. No, he says, take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. And otherwise, in other words, excuse me, stay a while, be in my presence. Or in Psalm 46, which is a favorite of mine and a favorite of many in times of trouble, God says simply, be still and know that I am God. When God spoke to Elijah, the prophet, on Mount Horeb, as Elijah was freeing, fleeing excuse me, from Jezebel, Elijah was looking for the presence of the Lord, but it wasn't in the earthquake, it wasn't in the wind, it wasn't in the fire, it was in the gentle whisper. See, God wants to reveal himself to you, but you'll miss him if you're just rushing by, I recommend you dig a well and you prepare for the provision of God. Uh, the other day, I made a Facebook post about an experience I had when the morning's devotion spoke directly to my heart. I had just finished whining and complaining to Rochelle and then I said, all right, I'm gonna do my devotions now. They always comfort me. I don't know why I was surprised, but that devotion was written perfectly for the condition of my heart at that moment. I was in the valley, but I dug a well and I waited on God. And then I read his promises. And I just had an overwhelming sense of peace. So I shared it with others. It was so profound. And friends, if you know me, I've said this before. I don't know how God does it, but I've experienced it many, many times. That when you finally surrender, you finally let go, Somehow God knows. It's like he's waiting on the sideline for you to just realize you can't do it by yourself. The barbell just starts to fall to your chest and he steps in. 
I actually hesitated to, ex to share this experience because it's so recent. It just happened this week, which I said at the beginning of the service, it's a God nod for me. I almost don't want to jinx anything by saying, look what God did, because <laughs> I'm still seeing the doctor, I'm still taking medicine, I still have healing to go. I'm not out of the valley yet. But why I'm sharing this with you is because the beauty of this story to me isn't really whether I'm healed or not, it's in the way that I experienced God in the valley. Honestly, it's an experience I couldn't have had if I wasn't brought low. If I was just sailing high on my own successes, but it was a deeply personal experience of meeting God in a way I've not met him before. And it was profound to me. So I share it with you. I truly believe that God met me in the valley. See, we enjoy him on the mountains, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys. And I understand this. God never promised that you would not go through any valleys. What he promised is that you would never go through the valleys alone, right? God with us. And the virgin will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I love how the psalmist concludes this section in verse seven. He says, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. They all make it. But remember, blessed are those who find their strength in the Lord. And the way that they go from strength to strength, they go from little strength to more of God's strength, little strength to more of God's strength, until they each make it up the mountain before God in Zion. We go from strength to strength, not our strength, but his strength. And we find his strength when we have no strength. The strength to strength in this psalm comes before they get to Zion. He gives them the strength to go through the valley and to climb the mountain. It's not when they get to Zion, it's the strength that brings them to Zion. See friends, I don't know what mountain you're climbing today. I don't know how much strength you have in your tank. If you're doing wonderfully, that's great. Enjoy the blessing of God. But if you're in the valley, and they do always come, don't just cry and complain that you're not on the mountaintop. Dig a well. Enjoy the presence of God and his strength in the valley. Wait on his provision and watch the springs and the pools appear. You may enjoy him on the mountain, but you get to know him intimately in the valley. You're not alone. He's with you and he gives you his strength. He reveals his character to you in that valley. We can sense his strength in those times in a way that we just can't sense him otherwise. That's just how it works. You know how when you come in from outside and your eyes can't see what's in the room right in front of you, but you wait until your eyes adjust to that dimness, and then you can see what's there. See, when you're cruising on the mountaintop and the sun is in your eyes, you're not seeing the beauty that's there in the shadows. When we totally and completely need him and we have nothing else, when we're traveling through the valley, but we are just passing through, we're not alone. The same God that is good to us on the mountaintop is good to us in the valley. And so, if you're in the valley right now, you won't be there forever. You're just passing through. God will lead you out. He's good, and he's with you, and he'll take you from strength to strength. When you can't handle anymore, lean into him and let his strength be sufficient for you even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Fear no evil. Why? Because Emmanuel, God is with you. Amen? And now, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And now, as we prepare to receive our offerings today, I pray that you would see your offering as one way that you draw near to God. Scripture says, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Sometimes when we're in the valley, our spirits are actually lifted by doing something outside of ourselves. It's one way that we experience the presence of God. You may make an offering using the links provided or by text or postal mail as we sing. Let this hymn announce the coming of our King.
Amen. We adore him forevermore. And now let us together profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, and, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Son our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. As you led Joseph like a flock, so now by your Son lead us into straight paths. Bring us out of the bondage of our sins and plant us securely in your eternal promises. Almighty God, in your blessed patience, you sent your prophets and apostles, pastors and teachers in all times that sinners would not perish, but rather come to repentance and find comfort in your word, which alone will stand forever. Preserve the servants of your church. Give to our congregation and all congregations an increase of hope that we may await the revealing of the new heavens and the new earth and lives of holiness and goodness diligent to be found without spot or blemish, and at peace. And God of all comfort, your word alone endures forever. The nations of the world come and go before you. Even kings and rulers are like grass which withers and fades. Preserve us from placing our trust in princes and mortal men. Give us leaders who will rule after your good pleasure, keeping order and protecting life, that we may live in godly quietness and honesty. And Lord of hosts, graciously regard all for whom we pray. Today we lift up to you, Redeemer members, for Karen, who's recovering from surgery. We thank you, Lord, for a good surgery. We ask for full healing. Also, Jim, recovering from hip surgery. It's all going well, and he's back at home. We ask for his full healing. I also ask for um, the healing from my lung infection, and just thank you for all the prayers, Lord. We lift up Karen and Joan and Janice who are in long-term care um, and health situations. And Father, we pray for family and friends. Um, for, um, we pray for uh, Carol McGeary's mother, Marilyn, um, that she heal after a pretty bad fall. And we pray, Lord, um, for Rochelle's niece's husband, Brian, with serious burns to both hands requiring extensive treatment. Also for her niece who has MS and will be caring for him. We um, ask you to lift, uh, we lift up to you, Lord, uh, Carol's neighbor, Julie, who's suffering from um, depression. And Lord, we lift up Vicki who continues to go through cancer treatments. Father, for all of these, for those who've asked for our prayers, we pray that they would find comfort, healing, and hope in you. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your love and mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, it's been good to be here with you today. I pray that our time together has been helpful for you. I hope you'll take a moment and fill out a connection card. We need that connection as much as you do. You can find links for the connection card, offerings, and our virtual Sunday school on our website, RedeemerByTheSea.org. Also, I want to let you know about these things going on at Redeemer. Thanks to those who have given to Operation Christmas Child, we were able to build 57 boxes together. If you're still in the spirit of giving, why not help out with our angel tree? 
It supports Marine families serving at Camp Pendleton. You have until December 15th to donate $25 gift cards that you can purchase online through our website, RedeemerByTheSea.org. And we've made a slight adjustment to the dates of our sixth grade First Communion class. Um, those Zoom classes will be on December 12th and December 19th. You can register sixth graders now so we can get you a workbook and the links necessary for that class. Also, our fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class begins this Sunday. Students register to get a workbook and the Zoom link. And even though we're not worshiping in person, we are still sharing the sacrament with an outdoor communion service today, that Sunday, December 6th, and then again two weeks from now on December 20th at 10 a.m. On that 20th, we'll have a special Christmas carol sing-along led by the Westminster Car Carolers. It's a great way to share the holiday spirit even as we share the Holy Sacrament. Another way to help share the holiday spirit is to supply poinsettia plants to decorate our sanctuary. They're $8 each, and you can get to take them home after Christmas. Now, something special that we have coming up next Sunday, December 13th, is a free gin and tonics outdoor concert. If you came to our last one, you know that they're a very talented group. Um, uh, they're so good that we invited them back. But if you came to the other one, come again this time because it's an all-new program including lots of well-known songs and some holiday favorites. That's Sunday, December 13th at 3 o'clock right on the patio and in the parking lot of Redeemer. And if you'd like to get a free Advent devotional, just visit the announcements page on our website or check your email announcements or call the church office. It's available in digital format or for download and podcast. So I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday as we continue our Advent series, God With Us, looking at the wilderness. If you've ever have felt uh, lost in the wilderness and all alone, this message will be for you. I hope to see you then. And so now, as we conclude our service today, my prayer for you is that when you're in the valley, you would know that God is with you and that you would experience him in a more intimate way in that season of weakness and that you would recognize but the valley is temporary. You're just moving through it. Do you know someone who's in the valley right now? Especially if they don't know the Lord, where else are they going to find strength? Why not share this message with them and let God work in their life as he's worked in yours? Perhaps even encourage them to join us next week. Until then, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Well, this concludes our service today. I'm hoping we won't have to meet much longer like this, but as long as we do, I'll look forward to seeing you here. In the meantime, have a wonderful, safe, and healthy week, and don't let the enemy or the valleys of this world steal your joy, but instead find strength in the Lord as he journeys with you and provides for you. See you next time. God bless you.